Okay, so right now we're going to go over the process and give an example of constructing free body diagrams, also known as force diagrams. Now, these steps when creating force diagrams. Step zero, sketch the system and its surroundings. The reason why this is step zero rather than step one is quite often when we're given a problem that we need to solve. The problem will also give a picture of the system and its surroundings, um, but occasionally it'll be a pure word problem or we're gonna be doing a lab or something in person that we need to analyze on paper. That's why step zero is kind of a situational step. But what you do need to do every single time you are drawing a force diagram is step one. Enclose the system within a system boundary. The reason for this is this is a way of communicating what the system that is being analyzed is. Because the force diagram will look radically different depending on what the system we are analyzing actually is. So communicating it by drawing that force diagram with the system boundary is of the utmost importance. Once you've identified the system by drawing that system boundary, just shrink the system down to a single point and then place that at the center of a coordinate axis with one axis parallel to the direction of motion. Once you have done that, then identify and represent all relevant forces that act on the object across the system boundary with a labeled force vector. While drawing those, indicate which forces, if any, are equal in magnitude to other forces by scaling the vectors. You know, to make sure that the arrows look about the same size if the magnitude of the force is about the same. Then, indicate the magnitude and direction of the sum of the forces, sigma f, acting on the system. The first example we're going to be looking at is this one. Draw a free body diagram for the skater moving at constant speed across frictionless ice. So we are already given a picture of a skater traveling to the left on top of frictionless ice. So we don't need to do step zero because it's already been drawn for us. So that means step one, we are going to be drawing our system boundary. But before that, I am also just identifying right here underneath my picture, two things that I know. I know that this skater is traveling to the left. And that's why I draw with a velocity vector. The velocity is to the left. However, despite the moving to the left, I am saying that the acceleration is zero because the problem is specifying this is a constant speed. That will matter when we're drawing our force diagram. We are to identify and draw a free body diagram for the skater. So my system boundary just encloses the skater themselves. I have shrunk that system down to a single dot. So that way, instead of trying to deal with like center of mass or figuring out how forces affect different parts of the system, we're just saying, hey, what effect on the system as a whole do we have? That's why we shrink it down to that single dot. Now, because this person is moving directly to the left, I am going to be having my x-axis pointing left and right. And that allows my y-axis to just be perpendicular straight up and down. We would consider this to be like the normal orientation of a coordinate plane. Once I've done this, I can start to identify which forces cross my system boundary. So the first force that I will typically have on every single free body diagram is the force of gravity. That is going to be a force acting on our skater, pulling them down to the center of the earth. So the labeling that I'm going to be doing is F for force, and then in subscript, the type of force, which is gravity, acting on the skater by the earth. So what I would like to know whenever we're constructing a free body diagram is the type of force, if we know it, as well as what two objects constitute that force. Because every single force is an interaction between two objects. So we need to be able to identify what those two objects are going to be. In this case, it's the skater and the earth. The next force that we're going to have is the force normal. That is going to be the push up on the skater by the ice. Now, I'm drawing this roughly the same size as the force gravity. 
well, actually, on a computer, I made exactly the same size. But visually, it should look roughly the same size because I know, vertically, there is no acceleration. This skater is staying on the ice at the current height they're at. They're not accelerating up, nor are they accelerating down. So our vertical acceleration is zero. That means the sum of the forces vertically should be zero. In fact, because I know they're traveling left at a constant speed, their horizontal forces also need to be balanced. Now, I need to see if there are any horizontal forces to figure out how I can balance them if I need to. So, this person, while they are traveling left, the only object they are actually directly interacting with is that frictionless ice. We have already explained how the ice is interacting with the skater, it is pushing up on them. Because we're saying this ice is frictionless, it's not going to be pulling back on them, so we're not going to have a force of friction resisting their motion forward. We don't have any forces pointing to the right, and then to maintain that balance, we can't have any forces pointing to the left. So while the skater is traveling to the left, that does not mean that they still need to be experiencing a force to the left. So the only forces acting on this skater at this instant in time is the force gravity and the force normal. So I can clean up my free body diagram a little bit by just, well, getting rid of those coordinate planes. So these are the two forces we have. Now this is going to be the fifth step, which arguably is one of the most important steps. The summation equation. Our sum of the forces horizontally is zero newtons. We have no forces on the x-axis of our coordinate plane, so we don't have any forces there, so the sum of the force should be zero newtons. Sum of the force vertically on the y-axis. We have two forces. We have force normal pointing up, and we have force gravity pointing down. That's why in the summation equation, they're going to be, well, interacting with each other, but in opposite directions, hence positive force normal, negative force gravity, because when we take the amount of force up and we combine it with the amount of force down, we would expect to see zero newtons of force overall, which is necessary to have zero acceleration.